All right, here we go. Happy Saturday, everybody. I'm very excited for today's show, and I hope you're able to uh, to join us. I know a lot of people are doing a lot of different things. Some people are out of town, traveling with family. But today, we had to have a show because today, on this day in 1985, Diane Fossey was killed. So today, I wanted to do a show to honor her memory, her legacy, and also her work, and to see... <clears throat> What, um, sorry, I'm getting my little echo there. <laughs> All right, so how's everybody doing? I hope you had a wonderful holiday. Uh, hi, Barbara, nice to see you. Hey, Vera, uh, nice to see you on here as well. Uh, two people that I know do a lot of work for animals, super important. And let's just have, uh, say, Barbara, happy Saturday. So again, today, the, re the main reason I wanted to do a show is to commemorate Diane Fossey. Uh, this day in 1985, she was killed. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about Diane Fossey's life. We're going to talk about the the type of person that it takes to make a change in conservation and her work in conservation and what animals are going through in order to where, where we are today with gorillas as well. Uh, so I'm trying this live. I haven't been able to do this live for quite a while because I live in an area where there's not a lot of internet, so I'm hoping that the signal will hold up. <laughs> but I wanted to do a live. I wanted to talk to everybody live. Hey, Jason, nice to see you on today. I know, Jason, this is a very passionate topic for you. I'm really glad you're here today. And uh, hello, Andrea, joining us from Romania. Merry Christmas. And I, I hope everybody had a wonderful holiday with their family and their friends. Uh, this is a very important uh, time of year. And one thing that I find incredible Incredible is that it is the one time of year where we do remember that kindness and love are the most important things. And just imagine, you know, they, they always say, like Bob Marley would write songs always talking about positive messages because he believed that the more you put a popular words, uh, you put positive words out, positive words into the universe, positive messages, the more people will, will hear them, and the more they will manifest into reality. And Christmas is actually a great example of that. It is an example of a time, and it's only a day or maybe a week, but everybody thinks in love, thinks through the filter of unity and through the filter of brotherhood and sisterhood, which is a filter we could use uh, way more often every other day of the year. And today we're going to talk about one of the kindest most loving, amazing people in the world, Diane Fossey. So, hey, Vera, uh, good morning from Mikuzi, KZN. It's nice to see you. Thanks, Vera. I appreciate you being on here. And uh, let's see, I can see Danielle as well today here. Uh, thrilled with the new baby born in Virunga. Fantastic. That is beautiful. I know, that is great news. Uh, Virunga is definitely going to be one of our, our topics for today. There's a lot of good things going on. Uh, hey, Heather, thanks for joining today. It's good to see you on here. Heather also does a lot of work with uh, guerrilla um, organizations out in Congo, Uganda, and a few other areas. So please, everybody, feel free to jump right in today. I would love to hear what you've got to say about, uh, about our topic today. Now, to start off with, uh, we always, well, actually, I guess I should do the opening first, right? <laughs> I was just so excited. I wanted to just jump into it. Um, so I wanted to uh, to say we are going to talk today all about what's happening with gorillas. There's a lot of mind-blowing facts about them. We're going to talk a little bit about what's happening with zoos, what's happening with breeding and reintroduction programs, and where are the gorillas today, what needs to be done, and how can we all take part in this. So um, anyway, as I always say, everybody, it is our world. Let's talk about it. All right. Well, we're back. By the way, uh, I'm very excited. Check this out. We finally got our conservation conversation mugs, and they are uh, available in the store. Uh, if you guys go into um, if you go into uh, ericycrown.com, which is my website, you can go check it out. And uh, everyone that you buy does help um, does help 
promote and continue my work. And actually, if you go to ericycrown.com, there's two ways you can help. One, you can either just donate, which a lot of people do, and I really appreciate it because we're getting ready for a bunch of direct action campaigns this year. And I'm hoping everybody out there might even be able to join me on a few of them if you're free and you feel like traveling this summer. Or you could just, <coughs> excuse me, go to the ericycrown.com and go to the shop. And inside you'll find conservation conversation goodies like the mug, which uh, it's so cool to see this on a mug. Um, I'd never really thought about that before. And anybody that was actually part of our giveaway, you'll be happy to know that your mug and some of the people that won the shirts and hats are all on the way out there. Uh, we actually had some issues with the beanie. We had to find a fully eco-conscious cotton beanie. So, um, you know, to make sure that we can have that and we're gonna be offering those soon as well. Thank you, Camilla. Yes, everyone needs a mug to come join us with uh, with the conversation every day. As we always say, join the conversation. And if you do order any of the mugs or anything, please take some pictures where you are because I would love to see uh, how around uh, the world our audience travels. So today, as always, we like to start with our quote. And of course, we are going to start with the quote from Diane Fossey herself, uh, which is a very, very important quote. And she says, when you realize the value of all life, you dwell less on what is past and concentrate more on the preservation of the future. That is beautiful. And that's what I'm talking about. This is somebody, <clears throat> she had an extraordinary life, but it was built on the foundation of kindness, love, and knowing sort of when you have a calling, what you have to do. Um, oh, Andrea bought one. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. So, hello, Elena. Uh, or my goodness, I don't know if I'll be able to say this correctly. Krashen. Farici, which means Merry Christmas in Romanian. <clears throat> so as we talk today about Diane Fossey, let's start off with just talking about Diane herself. Now, Diane is an amazing person. <clears throat> now, for those of you that don't know, uh, you can watch Gorillas in the Mist, which is an amazing movie. You can watch Secrets in the Mist, which is a great National Geographic documentary on the death of Diane Fossey. Now, today, back in 1985, Diane Fossey was murdered and she was murdered for standing up for gorillas. Now, anybody that's on the front lines in conservation is an extremely brave soul. When you put yourself in the world of conservation and you're out in the field and you're standing up for the animals, a lot of times you're disrupting very big industries. And those industries will have not a second thought in killing you. As a matter of fact, there are countries like Peru and Brazil where they have made it legal to kill conservationists or environmentalists in the line of duty. So hats off to the brave men and women around the world that put their bodies between these industries and these animals every day. It's, it's an amazing selfless uh, job that they have. Um, hello, Sonam, thank you for joining today. And hey, Megan, thanks for joining in today. It's good to see you guys here. I'm very happy. Um, so real quick, now, first let's talk about Diane Fossey, the trailblazer. Now this is amazing. If, if you're not too familiar with her life, she um, was basically, she grew up in California. She went to college. She became a, an occupational therapist and she worked with children. Uh, her main, and she was in Kentucky. Now, automatically you have to be a loving person to choose that field anyway. You know, that, that is something that is a very heartbreaking, but that you can automatically tell from Diane Fossey that she's somebody that was going to put the well-being of others before herself through the act of love. And, and she started that way and she continued that way. Now, while she was down there, I believe it was 1963, she decided to take her first trip and she went to Kenya. And like most of us know, in conservation, it basically takes every penny you have. Um, Companies spend millions and billions of dollars a year destroying the environment, and the environment is constantly being saved basically by volunteers. So now she didn't start saving the animals in 63, but she went to Kenya for the first time. She spent all of her money. She actually had to borrow money, and she went on a trip. Now imagine, this is 1963. The expectations of the time were not for women to go travel the world on their own. The, the expectations of the time were for women to, you know, um, 
sort of follow in the line of uh, of what was normal for that time, which was to raise families and and to be um, to be there. Now, what she decided was, I'm going to go to Kenya and I want to go see the world. Now, after she was there, she came back, kept her jobs. Heather, I adore her absolutely. She is a legend. She kept her jobs. She uh, she went back and she worked. And a lot of us that are in conservation also know that <laughs> it takes sometimes two jobs. You might go work nine to five. And at 530, you start working on your conservation work and you might work till midnight. So there is a lot of time and effort and dedication. You can't just jump into conservation. When we asked Aaron Kikowski, the other, the other on the other show, I said, what advice do you have for young environmentalists or conservationists? And he said, go become a doctor. And he was joking, but what he was saying was very true, which is that there is no industry here. You can find a niche and you can work in it, but it just takes passion, love, and kindness and to act that way and to just have a call that's higher than yourself. Um, my friend Pete Bethune of Earth Race Conservation said it very well, you haven't lived until you found a cause worth dying for. Now, Diane Fossey had no idea she was gonna be killed for her cause, but it is all in the same, uh, the same realm. So uh, Heather says, the animals are often forgotten in conflict zones, both wild and captive. Excellent point. And Heather, that <clears throat> is very true. Camilla, not all heroes wear capes. Absolutely. Um, those are two absolutely beautiful and true sentiments. Now, one of the reasons that the gorillas are having such a hard time is they do live in a very conflicted zone. Now, this is a simplified map, but this will show you Uganda, Rwanda, and the Congo all meet around Virunga National Forest. And I believe Virunga is in parts of all of these, uh, as well as Queen Elizabeth National Park. Now, the animals live in there, and there's a many reasons that the, the gorillas are in danger. And what I want to do is start off by talking about some of those issues that the gorillas face out in the wild, and then we'll talk about the, the, the dangers they face in captivity. But <clears throat> dangerous to gorillas basically comes down to four very important issues that are going on. One is the loss of habitat. So this would be all the illegal logging and the destruction of the rainforest areas and the, and the, the Congo Basin. Now, the Congo Basin lost around 165,000 square kilometers of forest during their study period. This was a study that was done between 2015 and 2017. In other words, one of the largest rainforests lost an area of forest bigger than Bangladesh in the span of 15 years. Now, as their habitat decreases, the gorillas are forced to live in uh, closer to other people. And that is always going to be a problem for any animal. The second biggest problem is bushmeat. Now, it's very common around the world for gorillas and monkeys to be killed and sold for bushmeat. And it actually goes hand in hand with the loss of habitat. Now, the reason I say that is that Generally, and this is what I found in the in in uh, the Amazon to be true, is that the guys that are illegally logging, they're not supposed to be there. So they don't show up with a bunch of equipment. They show up with their tools. And as they're cutting down the trees, they're killing any animals they find in the forest, generally to eat them, or they will save them if they can sell them on the wildlife black market, or they will sell the children. So they will kill the parents, eat the parents, and sell the children into captivity. This is something that's very, very common in almost everywhere in the world. Where there is illegal logging, there will be uh, illegal bush trade, illegal wildlife trade, and sadly, <clears throat> the bushmeat trade. Now, the bushmeat trade, although it's very common in the Congo, and it's very uh, there's a historical precedent for people eating bush meat out there. But we got to remember, it's not just the Congo. Five to 10 tons of bush meat entering Europe every year from Kinshasa, which is one of the capitals in the Congo. So bush meat's a problem all around the world. And if people might say to me, well, we don't eat bush meat. Well, I would say, how do you know? <laughs> they recently did a random DNA testing of meat all around America and found a high percentage of that meat came from bush meat. Now, bush meat is any animal 
that they kill. It is a gorilla. It's a monkey. It's a zebra. It's a uh, alpaca. It's uh, it's a whatever. It doesn't matter to them. They just kill it. And this this entire animal that has its own sentient life and family and way of thinking and being for thousands and millions of years becomes just a piece of meat on a plate. Um, that is very discerning. And meat is a very slippery slope. <laughs> uh, not to offend any meat eaters out there, I personally am not one, but you know, um, we get into this issue where dogs, um, horses, all kinds of animals are always being killed and eaten. And a lot of it is mystery meat. Uh, actually in, in the Congo, what they'll do is they'll, they'll kill and eat the animal right away. And then what's left over, they will uh, turn into jerky which is what we saw also what happened to pink dolphins in the Amazon. And that jerky can travel then to every market around the world and nobody will know any different. Now, more dangerous to gorillas, traditional beliefs. Uh, now, we always talk about Chinese medicine, but there's a lot of other types of traditional beliefs that can be extremely dangerous. These are traditional uh, magic beliefs all throughout Africa. And they uh, gorillas are sought after pets, which we've seen a lot of, uh, or trophies, and for their body parts which are used in medicine and as magical charms. So unfortunately, they are not immune to what all these other animals like pangolin, seahorses, and other endangered animals are facing just due to, to national uh, traditional beliefs. Now, this is where it gets complicated because we, of course, would like to say stop doing that, but that's a very colonial perspective to just walk in from the Western world where we can buy all of our food in the store, um, we have a series of religions that are all based on similar Bibles and they're just uh, slight variances to other religions around the world. I mean, Catholicism is the same in Italy as it is in America, as it is in Canada. But when you get into other religions that practice other things, it, it becomes very complicated. And then you have cultural beliefs. So how do we move forward by assisting and integrating in the indigenous people that have had these beliefs and these th this way of living for thousands of years into a new way of thinking which is no the, this is not here for us this we must preserve this to go from the conservation thinking that we want to save these gorillas so they can be eaten by tribes to say no um you know we we actually think that they should not be touched right now that's a change over between the conservation and environmentalist thinking and for everybody that that thinks, well, they're the same word. Please remember conservation means that it's the preservation of natural resources for the use of humans, whereas environmentalism, uh, environmentalism is defined as the preservation of natural land for the environment and for uh, nature itself, not for human use or consumption. So something important to consider. One more danger to the gorillas is actually Ebola. Now you have to remember, that not only is Ebola an issue, now Ebola, I, I put this up here because in 1994, there was an outbreak in Northern Gabon that wiped out an entire population of what used to be the second largest protected population of gorillas and chimpanzees in the world. So it's not only what we do, it's our diseases and people go to parks, they go to zoos, they go to you know uh, sanctuaries, sanctuaries, and they pass on these to, to gorillas and monkeys. Um, so that is a major thing. And don't forget AIDS was um, a, a, a virus that came from bushmeat and people unknowingly eating that bushmeat. And these animals have a different makeup and our bodies are not adept to them. Animals are not really here for us to, to eat. Of many animals you can eat will kill you almost instantly. And as we saw with the viruses, it's called a um, a zoonotic disease, uh, which is transferred from animal to man. And what happens is the animals have a special biology that allows them to deal with a lot of bacteria that our human bodies can't. So it's, it's ridiculous. And it, it comes from an uneducated way long ago perspective. It's like, hey, there's something, I'm hungry, I'll just eat it. To us understanding bacteria, viruses, infections, and we have to really consider that as we move forward. Um, and I think that that is a massive, um, that is a massive issue. <clears throat> Jason says in Virunga, it will continue 
to be the desire for companies to frack. Excellent point, Jason. That is another massive problem is fracking. And that is controlled by a lot of the gangs out there. So the, sometimes these guerrillas are just in the middle of civil unrest or gang warfare or always, unfortunately, oil company. Danielle says, so good. Thank you for that clarification. Conser conservation versus environmentalism. Yeah, that is, you know, that's always a very tricky one because I consider myself some days I'm like, I, I'm a conservationist. I want to help, you know, the, the, because to me, conservation, the beautiful thing about it is, is that our future and the animal's future are all put together. We're all one until we find a way to make sure that people can eat around the world which we should be able to do because if you just look at one billionaire's wealth, they could actually feed the entire world. But until we can solve the problem of abject poverty and starvation, we're never going to be able to solve the problem of saving animals because they're going to continue to be used in a way that is most practical. Jason says, putting my life on the line and combating the bushmeat trade until it's treated as a war-like action, it will always be a continuous struggle to defend. And Jason, thank you for your work out there. I know you've been on the front line and I know you've seen this firsthand. And I know you've actually battled in uh, in Africa to help fight against the bushmeat trade. And the bushmeat trade is, is a very insidious trade. Um, and it's something I actually want to do a bit more work on as well. Now, as we talk about these gorillas, what I want to bring up firsthand is that we're not that far away from them. <clears throat> Uh, this illustrates it perfectly. Gorillas are, we are 98% gorilla, or you could say gorillas are 98% human. And they're only 2% gorilla. That means that 2% of our DNA separates us from gorillas. I mean, we've seen how we treat our own humans, so it's not a shock that we treat our first animal relative this way. But we are one. You know, and the way we think is basically the way they think. I mean, 2% of DNA is not much. 98% is incredible. So I wanted to just kind of bring that up. Um, I wanted to show another clip here. This is a gorilla hand. And I'm going to hide my ear. There we go. <laughs> it's not part of the hand. But look at that beautiful picture taken by my friend Patrick over in the Congo. And that's a gorilla hand. And one more comparison just to really bring it home. These are fingertips. That's a gorilla fingertip, and that is a human fingertip. Look at the, look at the fingerprints. Look at the finger. That's mind blowing. Ninety eight percent. We share ninety eight percent of our DNA. Absolutely incredible. Um, now I wanted to bring up more of what's happening with the numbers of these animals around the world. So let me remove that real fast. Now this is from the IUCN Red List, and if you're not familiar with it. IUCN.org is an international group that checks numbers and assigns them um, to their endangered list. Now, you'll notice some say CR and some say EN. Now, recently there was, hey, Amy, thank you for joining us today, being on the show here with us. Um, now, recently people were celebrating, and this is this bothers me, people were celebrating that the mountain gorilla is bouncing back and you can see it says increasing that's how the population trend goes <laughs> now they were moved from critically endangered to endangered because they now range about a thousand where before they were ranging about 300. this is not a victory this is maybe a step in the right direction but we really need to rethink how we consider critical animals we have to have the utmost suffering. I always talk about the vaquita, you know, the little teeny uh, cute dolphin that's being killed down in the Gulf of Mexico. So Sea Shepherd and all the scientists show up there, and there is two of them left in the world, maybe six of them left in the world. It's too late. Somebody should have been paying attention 10 years ago. Um, we need to really pay attention to what's happening, and we need to Think about these numbers, and these are the numbers in the wild. So the Grower's Gorilla, it's decreasing. It's crit CR means critically endangered. That's critically endangered. Now, keep in mind that whether it's critically endangered or just endangered, like the Mountain Gorilla shows, don't be fooled. Even if it's endangered, it means eminent extinction. 
It does not mean these animals are safe. So for as much as we wanted to um, celebrate the, the uptick in mountain gorillas, we have to remember there's only a thousand of them. That is not anywhere further from extinction than we were five years ago. Uh, now, this is interesting. The Cross River Gorilla, who gets no press whatsoever, is the most endangered in all of Africa. There's only two to 300 of them left. The Eastern Gorilla went from 17,000 in 1998 to less than 4,000 today. The Western Lowland Gorilla, uh, which a lot of gorillas in the zoo, including the well-known Harambe that was killed, uh, the Western Lowland Gorilla numbers around 100,000, and you can see that it is decreasing. All of these animals have decreasing levels of populations, and I want to leave this up for a little bit longer. And again, the mountain gorillas are only at 1,000, and don't be fooled that people were celebrating that, yay, you know, we got more mountain gorillas. They went from critical to endangered. Well, that is not good enough. That's far from being good enough. That is still the, the, on the, the, slide, uh, the slow slide to extinction. And we have to really think about that. Um, hey, Bruce, thanks for joining us. And Bruce in Scotland, it's nice to see you. And um, see, Heather, yes, exactly. And I know Heather spends a lot of time working with a lot of different groups um, uh, about different types of gorillas and ways to try to stop these extinctions. Uh, Jason says, I pray they do not suffer from a COVID-19 potential outbreak. And you know, Jason, that's interesting because uh, a lot of my friends in the forests have told me that they're keeping the national parks closed right now due to people bringing and tracking in COVID-19, which they will be extremely susceptible to. I believe there's already been a few deaths. Follow Patrick Siddiqui. Uh, yes, now, uh, before I continue with this comment from Danielle, I wanna show everybody Patrick. And Patrick, this is Patrick. You may have remembered him. He was a very viral image where these two gorillas stood up behind him. And Patrick is one of the care uh, the caregivers in Virunga. And I believe he's, uh, he's no longer working there, but he still spends his time doing that. 98% um, share DNA. So moved each time I see his photos, direct as a ranger of Virunga National Park. For them, everything is on the line. So let's connect to show our solidarity and community with these amazing individuals living continuously on the front line. And you know, Danielle, that is a great point because in Virunga, there was recently, I believe 12 rangers killed. And by the way, if you haven't seen the documentary Virunga, that is an amazing documentary. Um, please check that out. Um, Heather says, only because of the babies born this year, they had a set of twins one or two others born. See, and that is the tricky thing with thinking that these populations are growing when in fact, um, not so much. Um, uh, Jason says, extremely interesting. People should know mountain gorillas cannot survive in captivity. And that brings us to the next point coming up here soon. What is our human solution and is it correct? Um, Danielle says, I wonder if critically endangered category is too late miscategorized. That's a good point, actually, Danielle. I think Shouldn't just, if they hit endangered, shouldn't we just at that point say, bah, 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 we must stop what we are doing because everything that goes from endangered slides into critically endangered and will disappear off the list. We talked about the pink dolphin, which is endangered. And again, don't be fooled if endangered versus critically endangered. Endangered means, um, and this is true according to IUCN, it means eminent extinction. We cannot continue that way. Heather, lowland are the only ones kept in captivity. Mountain gorillas do not survive. And that's a great point. And again, we're going to get to, um, oh, did I put the wrong picture up? Matthew, okay. So um, Heather says the parks are being closed, has made an uptick in poaching. Very good point. Lost revenue to the community around the park is adding to their desperation. And that is another really important point. And again, remember, until we really discuss poverty, or discuss how local villages and tribes can survive while protecting the animals around them, we're not going to be able to stop poaching. You know, the guy that's poaching is going to make just enough money to feed his family. And I'm not here to empathize with poachers, but until we understand why poachers poach, we're not going to be able to stop it. They're not part of the huge syndicate that sends that 10 tons of bush meat over to Europe and is living, you know, has a Rolls Royce and is living in, in a, with a giant pool in their backyard. We're talking about people that go out and risk their lives and are very often killed by rangers 
leaving three or four orphan children. It's a very complicated topic. It's easy for us to, to sort of view it in its more simplistic terms over here, but we have to remember it's super complicated. And we can't cheer on those memes when poachers are killed. Um, poachers very often do that because it is the only option that they have. And the real bad people, the ones that are the middlemen, the guys that work in customs that allow things to fly out knowingly with a couple bucks in their pocket, there's a lot of other people that are to blame, but the poachers get the, the end of it because they're the easiest to, to find. And like Heather said, now with the poaching has just gone up. Um, this next graphic might be, this might be a little graphic, but these are some of the gorillas that were found poached uh, and killed. This was a bust in Virunga. So it's a very inhumane thing. Um, uh, now, you know, this here, this is actually a monkey that I found in the Amazon. This is, was basically, you can see, they just tie their necks uh, loosely. And he was tied to that grate behind him. And he was on a giant pile of cement. And that's where he lived. Um, it took everything in me. I actually went up to try to start cutting the, <laughs> the rope. Um, the monkey was not quite sure what was going to happen. Uh, and again, it goes back to this conflict. This is, this is our hero, uh, Why Rwanda, with a decapitated gorilla. And I usually try to not show the, the most disgusting of the things, but this is a very important thing to keep in mind as we talk about it. Gall goes back to bushmeat, and this is the bushmeat. This is, I know I've shown you guys this, this right up on other, um, other, other shows that we've done, but please check it out because, you know, these are being sold, by the way, as, as rib meat in other countries, and people don't know that they're coming from monkeys, which not only creates deadly bacterial possibilities, but it's decimating the populations. So the question is, what do we do? Well, at the moment, our solutions tend to come in the form of zoos and sanctuaries. Now we're gonna start with zoos, because zoos are probably the most contested, difficult aspect. And I would love to know, please put your comments down below, what you think about zoos and their things. Now, to begin with, with zoos, one of the things I wanted to talk about is the fact that zoos, okay, the concept of a zoo is that we're gonna take the animals, we're gonna protect them, we are going to let everybody come in, understand, see the animals, and that will help fall in love with the animals. Now, zoos have been around a long time, and I haven't seen any of these animals that are in zoos that are endangered, their populations increasing as a result of people taking their children to stare at these poor animals as they are stuck in zoos. Now, zoos are not haphazard. Zoos have been around a long time. Zoos started in Egypt. The first private zoo was in England not that long ago. And um, as a matter of fact, Cincinnati Zoo, where uh, the next one, one of the most important silverbacks to be killed, which is Harambe, was killed after a child fell into his enclosure because the parent wasn't watching. This child fell about 15 feet into a, a cement enclosure. And Harambe, then started to protect the child. And as they were protecting the child, as he was protecting the child, people misunderstood his actions and he was killed holding the child's hand as he was protecting him. Harambe had climbed up that 15 foot embankment to bring the child back to the parents. But by then the uh, there was a lot of chaos. Um, the firefighters were there, they took over the scene and they made the call to kill Harambe who was killed inside of the Cincinnati Zoo in May, years back. So if we have an endangered animal in a zoo, first of all, is that the best place for them? Is that helping them? Uh, you know, we're, we're funneling all these wild animals into zoo breeding programs, thinking that somehow the zoo breeding programs will then funnel the animals back into the wild, but it doesn't work that way. They use the argument that the animals don't know how to behave in the wild. They use that argument with dolphins. They use it with monkeys. They use it with every animal. And <clears throat> that is, in, in, you know, and a lot of people have learned now with blackfish, we know that the orcas are not doing well in those little swimming pools. It's the same thing if you have a monkey in a cement enclosure, uh, aside from the other amounts of cruelty. Now, the reason that they do it is money. Um, the AZA, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, 
This is one of the biggest organizations. There's $24 billion a year industry. So you can get an idea. Now, the AZA is not the only company that runs zoos and aquariums. Uh, as you can see, they have they have zoos all across the world that they run. Um, they, they give an accreditation to the AZA, and all that means is that they follow the AZA guidelines. Um, <clears throat> and that is, um, you know, that this is very disturbing that they're everywhere. And again, we've all learned about dolphin captivity, but what about our closest relative that we share 98% of our DNA with, the gorilla? Now, the animals in the AZA facilities around the world uh, over 800,000 animals, over a thousand of those are threatened or endangered species, which I think is a really crazy thing. Now, I want to talk about the breeding real fast because I've had a lot of interesting debates with that. And uh, I actually want to have a guest on that runs a zoo in a few upcoming um, shows so we can actually learn a little bit more. But here's the thing. <clears throat> These zoos all breed a different form of endangered animal. Now, the Endangered Species Act says that you cannot, for profit, um, breed endangered animals. Sounds great on paper. But the reality is zoos now trade endangered animals to each other. So no pennies are made directly from the breeding of the animal. They're made through the exhibition of the animal. And that's a loophole. And it's a loophole that's been going on for 30 years. It's a dangerous loophole, and it's a loophole that is killing more and more endangered animals every year. So it's something very important to think about. Now, I'm not here to fully demonize zoos. Some of them actually do have programs, but then they say we can't reintroduce them to the wild. They would never survive out there. Now, why is this? Now, the, the basis of this argument is something called zucosis which I never heard about until both Heather and Jason taught me about zucosis. Hey, Angela, thank you for joining. Hey, Sherry, I'm glad to see you on here. If you're not familiar with zucosis, zucosis is a term, and this is a, you can Google this and check it out. What it means is that when an animal is in captivity, they display behaviors based on their captivity. They are not natural behaviors. We're all familiar with the elephant's pacing. We all know that if you see that, it means they're in distress. We all see that with dolphins. Dolphins will actually ram their heads and try to kill themselves. And we've seen videos of that recently, circulating viral videos uh, of some dolphins that are kept in a pool, I believe, in um, somewhere in Asia. Uh, the dolphin that I was working with down in Iquitos in Peru tried to kill himself. Um, and that is another major thing. So what happens is we... We take these animals out of the wild, right? Wait, yeah, this will be the wild. We funnel them into a breeding program in captivity. Now, there are good breeding programs, and there are good reintroduction programs, and there are good sanctuaries. And, you know, I'm, I'm not familiar with good zoos, but I know they exist. Um, but what happens is the animals, now these endangered animals are here and they're bred. Then they're put back into zoos. And from zucosis, we know that they do not exhibit their natural behaviors. Now comes in Joe Q Public. I want to go see a gorilla. And the gorilla that I'm watching is not acting naturally. So every bit of information I have learned about this animal is actually incorrect because I'm watching zucosis. I'm not watching animal behavior. So zucosis is a very important thing. And it's something that zoos wrestle with. It's something that uh, breeders wrestle with. It's something, I mean, look, one of the biggest shows was the uh, Tiger King or whatever horrible show about uh, horrible breeding practices that have just turned into this let's look at animals and let's enslave them into captivity for our amusement, which we've stopped doing that with circuses. We know it's wrong with SeaWorld, but how can we have not extended that to our closest? DNA relative? It's a, it's, a, it's a tough question. There's no easy answers here. Very complicated topic, very complicated um, issues. Now, um, yeah, Heather said um, they harvested Harambe's sperm after they killed him. Now, to go back to the zoo, one of the things about 
zoo that is very interesting. They have a thing called the DART team, which is a dangerous animal response team. Now, these are trained sharpshooters that are part of the zoo staff that are kept completely quiet and secret. You've probably never heard of them. Uh, they do exist, and they keep very high-caliber guns stashed away in critical places around the zoo so that if an animal gets out, the first reaction is they go, they grab the gun, and they kill it. Now, this might make sense if you're talking about keeping people from being killed by animals, but if you're talking about an endangered animal where you can number them, right? You can't say that there's 7 billion or so of them. Um, if there's 300 and you kill one, there is now 299. So should we allow endangered animals to be kept in zoos? And Cincinnati Zoo is a great example. By the way, it's the second oldest zoo in the United States. It gets tons of money from the state. Uh, I believe last year they took in, I, it was hard for me to, I had to look this number up, $5,700,000. Um, and they put, uh, I think, a million or so into conservation. So they say, we're going to put money into conservation, but it just goes back to um, allowing them to bring more animals into their zoo to study them, which they're studying zoocosis. So in the end, it doesn't really um, work out that way. Uh, Danielle says, amazing. Uh, yes, you know, and Danielle, I was amazed to learn so much about gorillas recently. Um, and, and amazing that we don't have more knowledge about them considering how closely we are related to them. Jason says, as an adjunct professor in wildlife conservation, I teach an actual module on zoo ethics. It's archaic that we know now will only cause captivity, depression, and zoocosis. And that's a great point. Why are we moving continuously forward uh, with knowledge that has been shown to be incorrect? If they know about zoocosis, should we keep animals like that? Sherry says, does that help save the breed? Fascinating question, Sherry. Um, you know, the, the thing is, it doesn't because if these animals are all being bred and traded to other zoos for exhibits, none are being brought back into the wild. So all we're ending up with is a synthetic universe of, of wild animals. Uh, it reminds me of in Blade Runner, you know, my favorite line is she, is the, one of the dancers, she has a snake and the guy says, is that a real snake? She's like, what do you think I could afford a real snake? And that's where we're headed. Um, maybe not with synthetic animals, but we are headed to where all natural wildlife is being funneled into zoos in those areas. Um, and as Jason points out, AZA distribution of net profit is only 2.5 back to conservation, which obviously has not been working if they've been around this long because it wouldn't go any better. Um, Sherry says, wouldn't it be safer to study them in the wild? Absolutely. That's why Diane Fossey was so important today to talk about because what she did is she went out there and just set up a tent and then built a little spot and said, let's study right here. We're in their world. Let's go to, to their world. We can't bring them into our world and then study them. It just doesn't work that way. We need to think differently moving forward. And Sherry, you bring up a great point. Uh, Heather says, Diane has been one of my lifelong heroes. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think that that is absolutely super important point. Uh, you know, Diane, not only was she a trailblazer in doing something you shouldn't have been doing in the 60s, which is traveling on your own to Kenya, right? And then setting up camp and then eventually getting involved and then staying over there, much to her own economic danger, economic problem. She wrote a book, Gorillas in the Mist, to help share what she had learned because at that time books were the were the main medium and they were starting to use some film but for the most part um you know it really uh there was very little um that's going on there so uh let's see now i'm curious uh angie a friend of mine who always is out on the front line says uh poaching syndicates are hectic and we're fighting a war down here especially in south africa where the rhino stronghold is so many dangerous 
for the rhinoceros in South Africa. A couple great documentaries that are out right now, Breaking Their Silence, made by my friend Kerry David. Um, there is Restrepo, which is an amazing documentary. There is a documentary called The Last of the Animals. Uh, I think it's on Netflix now. Fantastic. There's The Ivory Game. Fantastic. Um, I'm working in conservation, anti-poaching, bushmeat poaching is not entirely different to rhino, elephant poaching, or even lion leopard. Bushmeat is a huge trade now and brings in loads of money. It's become part of the illegal wildlife trade. A ranger died not too long ago stumbling upon bushmeat poachers. A lot of the meat ends up in Europe. Yes, and that is why we have to remember that <clears throat> this insatiable appetite for meat worldwide is causing, well, like we talked about fish fraud, there's meat fraud, you know? I mean, people are eating monkey and they don't know it. They're eating bush meat and they don't know it. And we are destroying one of the most biodiverse places in the world, in Africa. And people are being killed at an alarming rate. Being a put, being, being, um, working in conservation in Africa is one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Being a ranger in Africa is one of the most dangerous jobs and one of the most thankless and selfless jobs that there are. Um, but uh, Angie, thank you for all your work out there. And I want to say, Jason, thank you for your work out there. And Heather, thank you for your work to always fight for monkeys uh, and gorillas. It's, it's, a, it's a hard topic, but I'm glad we were able to talk about it a little bit today. There's a little bit more we want to get into. So we've discussed, um, you know, the fact that there are all these dangers that are coming into, um, oh, I'll make sure I didn't miss any, uh, any other interesting um, comments here. Now, Angie also made a great comment, said Rwanda is quite safe for gorillas as the gorilla doctors work with one health approach, which means communities are involved and get helped and treated as well as their domestic animals are getting treated. None of the parks in Rwanda are solitary, touristy, and ignore the communities. That's beautiful. That's what we were just talking about. Poaching is an organic problem that comes from, and Angie, correct me if I'm wrong, poverty and desperation. The guys that are being killed that are poachers are generally um, from very poor villages. They grow up and hunting is part of their tradition. So they grow up hunting, they have a tradition. Uh, there is nothing to judge about that. But then somebody says to them, hey, while you're out, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you bring me this monkey, or I'll give you a thousand dollars, or I'll give you your entire year's salary if you bring me um, a zebra or a, a rhino horn. So it starts with desperation and it creates an opening to, I think a lot of poachers doing things that they normally would not jump in and do. And the line in a lot of these communities is very blurred between hunting and poaching. And unfortunately, the endangered animals are the ones that are paying for it. Uh, and she says, it's so sad. Positive thing is we got African parks. They are the best and strongest conservation entity out there. And that is what I wanted to say. We do have one positive way forward, and that is to check out Virunga, check out Queen Elizabeth National Park, check out what these parks are doing and find a park that you agree with their approach. And they, they'll always have a way for you to donate directly to them. There are a lot of groups that are out there trying to save gorillas as well that are direct action. It's very complicated to know which groups are the ones to really invest in. So um, there's a lot you know, to, to really think about there. Um, uh, Jason does say uh, One Health is a fantastic organization. I, did, uh, I didn't know, uh, know about them. Um, let's see. And there's a couple others. So as you guys can check out in the comments below, uh, Angie and Heather and Jason are mentioning a couple really good organizations you can go check out that will help. Um, giving money to a zoo is not going to help save any animals. And as we can see this, because we now have the beauty of history, right? We have had zoos for say 50 years, hundred years, and on their promise, of making the world better for the animals, all we see are more animals endangered, more animals species decline, more animals in the wild being squeezed out by, you know, hunting trade, uh, illegal logging, loss of habitat due to people building villages, houses, housing developments, all kinds of places. And 
so you know there, there's almost nowhere for them to go now um and um and sherry brings up a great question which i think is um sherry says can't they punish the person purchasing these wild animals too sherry that is a great question and that is where it all falls apart the blame stays on the local village poacher but then it does go through customs generally through people that are paid off i don't want to cast dispersions on people that work in in there but very rarely do the outgoing customs uh officials stop these things um so that is one major issue then it's mostly run by syndicates and cartels that get these things like for example the rhino horn if the poacher gets it sells it to the middleman who's generally i want to say european or possibly asian um generally the middlemen are not African, uh, sometimes they're South African, but not very often do they come from those areas. Some of the middlemen are, but basically they're utilizing the poor to get what they need. And then once they get it, it goes into their network and they pay off so many people. And it's a massive, massive enterprise that gets these poor things around the world. Same problem we have with the legal logging in the Amazon. They'll get the poorest of the people and they'll say, we're going to give you all of your equipment you need. You're going to get the chainsaw, you're going to get the gasoline, everything you need, and we'll give you $100 a tree. And then they send out this poor guy that thinks he can make 100 bucks a tree, and his family is starving. His village is 20 people. He cuts down the trees. And then what he finds out is that that company did that with 100 guys. Suddenly, the price of the tree is a dollar. So now they don't even make it back enough to pay for the equipment that had been loaned to them by the companies. And there is a cycle of poverty. And I don't know if this is the same in poaching communities. Uh, I'm actually going to be working um, out in Af Africa and South Africa this year, working on these topics. But in the Amazon, that's how they do it. And it keeps people in a cycle of poverty. And once they're in a cycle of poverty and their children are starving, then the rules change for what people are willing to do. So it's not quite as simple as blaming poachers and stopping poachers. We have to, what about the markets? I mean, Sherry, here's a great example. You brought up a great point. Ivory pianos, ivory keyed pianos. If you find an ivory keyed piano in a wealthy person's house, that's, whoa, that's really impressive. That's, that's the real nice thing. No, we have to stop thinking that way. Faux fur. What's the point of that? We're still wearing fur. Like the longer we continue to make animals commodity products and not living, breathing entities that need to be protected, we're always going to have this problem. Because once they become a commodity, the distribution chain really gets gets in there. Um, Jason says rhino horn is about five times the amount of gold right now. Gold is about 18, 90 per ounce. And that, not only that, like animals are so uh, discredited and discarded that if you think about it, it's $1.99 for a pound of beef and it is $3.99 for a pound of almonds. Think about that. Like, you know, vegans always say, well, the vegan food's so expensive. Why is that? Why, why are almonds more important than an animal's life? It, we've commoditized animals, whether they're in zoos. Again, we had a, a previous show on sanctuaries to talk about what kind of sanctuaries are good sanctuaries or bad sanctuaries. And that is something that, you know, you really have to investigate and learn. There are good ones, but there are also ones that exploit animals just for that. Uh, Heather says, working with poachers, pygmy and the batwa, the rangers working alongside them, We've done so for the past year. In our program, they're working together with the goal of cons conservation learning center and aquaponic gardens. Fantastic, that is a great solution. Uh, Angie says, um, Heather, that's nice to hear. In Zimbabwe, there are pangolin protectors and you got orgs in Kenya that turn poachers into rangers. In South Africa, greed rules, unfortunately. Money, money, money. Um, and hopefully, uh, that can be changed over. And again, that brings us back to the fact that as long as there's poverty, there can be exploitation of the poor for the wealth of the wealthy and the rich. So United States, second largest purchaser of ivory in the world. Where are you holding your responsibility? We just recently loosened laws that allow trophy hunting back into the States. This is working against all these people that are in the field giving their lives to protect animals, 
it's a slap in the face to them. And every country needs to be a little bit more on board. We need to take responsibility being a Western market for what we do. We have some of the, the um, amazing, I mean, we have tons of Chinese medicine live and wet markets all around San Francisco, New York, uh, everywhere. So the markets are, are, if not even more so to blame than, um, than the poachers themselves. Danielle says, so great to have you on this chat, Heather. Yeah, Heather, thank you for joining us today. I know you do a lot of work with poaching. Same with you, Jason, and with you, Angie. Uh, three of my heroes that really are fighting poaching. Um, and I'm just excited to see everybody down here joining the conversation. And this is really important. Uh, Dave says, uh, keep up the horsepower. <laughs> Always good stuff. Thanks, Dave. Um, this is Captain Dave. Uh, he's uh, working on the Dominion up in Washington and always works on conservation projects with local groups out there as well. They're doing a lot of salmon conservation up there, which is imp impressive. Angie says, also in South Africa, the courts let poachers out on bail. Oh, I've, I've heard of that too, that there is so much corruption within the court system. And again, that goes back into them being able to pay off everybody. Excuse me. And, you know, that also comes back to when we talk about Diane Fossey, she was hacked to death in her cabin and then the entire investigation was botched from the beginning now she also dabbled in trying to shame local villagers through local customs uh perhaps venturing into colonialism in a way that she didn't realize she would because in the 60s and 70s nobody thought about colonialism whereas now we're very conscious of it but there are you know, uh, Angie, my friend uh, down there that runs k and Conservation, um, he said to me, Kalen Padiachi, he said, what we need is a South African, a South Africans to create South African solutions for a South African problem that's also being fueled by the rest of the world. And I think that there's a lot of truth in that. We, you know, we can come in and assist us Westerners and us, us foreigners, but we know more than anything, we need to enable the people that are there who, whose lifeblood is that soil and that nation and the pride that people have in their countries is amazing down in Africa. The people I've spoken to in Congo, people in Rwanda, people in Uganda, uh, people all around South Africa, Johannesburg and, and surrounding areas. It is amazing the amount of beautiful pride people have. And it's, it's very contradictory to the American version of saying, I'm not even going to look at this problem. I just want to buy my things, you know, so we all need to jump in and get responsibility back to it. Um, Heather is hoping to provide and help these, these anti-poaching groups through supply. Uh, and that's important. Give them a way to help them prop themselves back up. And Donna Cole. Hey, Donna. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, thoughts on the ongoing use of pesticides, especially carbiferin to kill wildlife in Africa. I've reported extensively on these issues here on the Delmarva Peninsula with several bald eagles poisoned. Jeez. And you know, uh, Donna, that is a great, that's a very fascinating topic that we don't hear enough about. The, the topic of, of animal uh, issues, um, killing wildlife in Africa always comes down to poaching. But what about pesticide use? What about industrial runoff? What about illegal gold mining that puts all that mercury into the water and creates uh, hypoxia zones? throughout the water you bring up a great point which is that we need to start talking about africa as if it's america we need to i mean not not that it's the same thing but we need to remember that their problems are not always unique to where they are we have poachers here in america too and the loss of biodiversity and the loss of all endangered animals the loss of any animal creates an unnatural balance in our universe that we can all help fight which I think is really important. Uh, Danielle says, let's keep the conversation going around pandemics and zoonotic diseases. And that's a great point. Um, we have this amazing uh, moment in time right now where we're living through a pandemic. Um, now we've had zoonotic diseases. We've had H1N1, we've had Ebola, we have had the AIDS that have all come through, proven to be through zoonotic. Um, now the connection between deforestation and demystifying poachers Deforestation, yeah, that is another one that completely, uh, what people like Heather and Angie and Jason are really seeing. I feel as someone who tries to seek out and stay informed, this information is still not accessible. You're absolutely right. 
and so much misinformation and pointing fingers circulating without clear focus and united front on action. Thank you all for all the work you do. And Danielle, you say it beautifully. This is the thing. It's a multifaceted problem. And if we just put the answer into one thing saying, it's this guy who killed an elephant yesterday, that is not going to solve this. And that is not going to help these animals in their in their fights. And, you know, bushmeat is a huge topic that there is no massive resource for. People are trying to get more attention to it, but it's a very difficult topic. And it's a topic that needs a lot more conversation. Um, Angie says, let me be the devil's advocate. If we want trophy hunting to stop, we have to find other solutions. In some areas in Zambia, that's the only thing that keeps communities going. Hmm. A friend of mine is now trying to turn a very beautiful and wild, wild area that is run by a community and hunting lodge into a photographic safari camp to prove it can work. That's where Africans of all colors get worked up and say, yes, we need the Western support and money, but we also, a lot of the time, oh my gosh, it's not going to let me continue that, com that comment. Um, it's not showing me the rest of it. But uh, let me see, one second. Um, that's okay. Uh, but also a lot of the time know what's going on in the ground. We need to help with solutions. Then we can damp the hunting of endangered species. And you know what, Angie, that's a great point. That's a great point. In order to save them, we have to find another way. Now it's a very debated topic. The idea of canned hunting, the idea that, uh, there will be a poacher. I'm not a poacher. Sorry. There will be a farmer that will farm, say, rhinos. And for every 20 rhinos he grows and he releases, he takes the one that's dying off and he sells the trophy license. Very controversial um, approach to things, but a very fascinating topic as well. That actually deserves its, its own whole show. <laughs> Coralie, hello, late to the game. I'm glad to see you on here, Coralie. I know you fight a lot for the environment and there, excuse me, are just so many uh, issues surrounding the loss of these animals, the loss of biodiversity, and the loss of our habitat as we know it. And as Angie says, bushmeat and deforestation is a huge issue. Um, and that is a big problem. And uh, Jason, yes, I think Danielle is incredible. I know Danielle has actually worked on programs to incorporate uh, local villages into the solution. And that's, I, I think that's the only way to move forward. So many companies raise millions of dollars and they have, you know, these retreats together. And it's just a bunch of Western people talking about how to stop these, you know, uh, these other people from, from ruining our world. And it's an incorrect approach. The approach needs to not be colonialized. It needs to be um, through the eyes of people that have thousands of years of knowledge of not only their land, but of the animals that are there. And I think we can learn a lot from them. And that's what Diane Fossey did. Again, to commemorate Diane Fossey on today, the day she was murdered, we have to remember she went over there, stranger in a strange land, doesn't matter. She went where she was needed. She went where there was a least amount of information and she did her best to gain information firsthand by sitting with the gorillas, by becoming part of them, by letting them learn to accept her. Nobody had ever done that before her, you know? Um, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. Why she's not part of the National Geographic uh, Explorers Club, I have no idea. They tend to be a little bit more colonialized, whereas Jane fought things from a First Nation person's perspective. And we've lost that here in America. A lot of other countries try to maintain it. But perhaps that is our only solution moving forward. And that does go back to empathy, kindness, love. It goes back to not saying you're the bad guy, but saying, how can we remove your desire to do that? Uh, it all comes back to money in the end. Um, poverty, as many of us feel, is a con construct. And the idea is to keep people poor so that we can take advantage of them. It happens here in America. If it weren't for poverty, people wouldn't do half the things they do and they would not um, find themselves in those situations. Um, 
there is money that could solve all the world problems in one guy's bank account and the other guy works 40 hours a week and he can't afford to feed his family. And as we've seen in America, even if you have a, a job that's now considered an essential worker, but two years ago wasn't given that title, you cannot even afford your own apartment in America. And that's true. Being as somebody that works in conservation, there's almost no money in conservation. Uh, not only that, but you have to find ways to support yourself. And the money you do make, you gen tend to just pay back into conservation. So it's a very multifaceted problem with a new a new way to get in forward. Uh, Marty Snyderman. Hey, Marty, thanks for joining today. Awesome to see you on here. Marty says, I got in so late. I apologize if this has been covered. Do you know if I'm correct that the Bible explains that animals are here for human exploitation? And if so, is this concept part of the overall problem? Marty, I... I think that is a wonderful question. I do believe in Genesis that they do say that um, the animals are here for the man and uh, and they even tell them which ones they're not supposed to eat. And then they say that the man shall hold dominion over all animals. And perhaps that is one of our big Achilles heel as colonial thinkers is to think that we are the caretakers of this earth instead of we are part of this earth. Um, perhaps we think that everything's okay. It's only natural that we've built cities and roads and all these amazing things for humans and destroyed everything around us for it. Um, I personally, I find that a great topic. I like talking to people about that topic a lot. I'd love to hear everybody's comments on that down here below. Today's actually a way longer show than I anticipated. <laughs> Today's an amazing conversation. I want to thank everybody. Um, I want to thank that everybody for being here today. This has been incredible. Jason says, read this out loud. You got it. I think you do tremendous work and should be thanked. Ah, well, thanks, Jason. Um, there is a lot of more work to be done. And as we all play our part, you know, we need the people that are researching. We need the scientists. We need the direct action conservationists. We need people fighting poaching on the front line. We need the rangers. Thank you, Rangers, for being the most selfless and most dangerous job in the world. And again, if you guys missed the beginning of this, it is legal in some countries to kill an environmentalist or conservationist in the line of duty. That actually was born, I believe, in Peru when a bunch of the indigenous tribes started to fight against Belo Monte Dam and they took over another oil uh, and gas place and a bunch of them were killed by the army. And instead of prosecuting the people, they changed the law. So that's that's how it, it happens like that way. Uh, Danielle says, Diane Foss, he had amazing training observing children, exactly, and their behaviors to understand their needs. We'll, we do well to apply that versus pathologize, medicate, hospitalize, jail, et cetera. And that is a great point as well. Um, when we are coming in and we are doing pathologizing, uh, just medicating, hospitalizing. We are ignoring natural tendencies and checking and, and almost defining people through societal uh, ideas and societal actions. Uh, Gabor Mate is a very fascinating guy that talks about that we cannot separate our environmental pressures from our actions and our mental construct because the two are together, very much like zucosis. Um, you know, if you grew up in a really hard, hard place, um, you know, say in New York, in the Bronx, um, you're growing up in zucosis. You're not growing up the same way as you would if you had all these other uh, natural ways of, of that humans should live together. So it's a great point, Danielle, that you bring up. Um, Heather says, that's a big interest to me. I've also done a lot of work with water contamination and I participated, organized a few pipeline protests. Another way that they do get rid of uh, our natural understanding of things. And it's another way that we are colonizing our world instead of trying to decolonize our minds. So just like Diane Fossey, we should decolonize our minds. We should look at the world around us and understand how we fit into it. There's not that big of a difference, um, you know, between what she did every day that was her passion and she was driven to her passion regardless of how what danger it put her in and regardless of what happened to her 
you know, and while things like Harambe continue, while things like this poor monkey continue, while the bushmeat trade continues, you know, while we forget that we are part of nature, and nature is part of us. So we always bring back to this graphic. Marty, it's like you said, if we believe what the Bible said about man holding dominion over all things, that comes into Western colonialized ego. But if we look at the world through traditional eyes and through eyes of First Nation people, we're going to understand a lot deeper that we are part of the ecology, not owners of the rest of the world. It's not our world to exploit. At this point, it may be our world that we need to save. You know, we are, people always say, well, we're a virus, we're a virus, we're ruining the world. Perhaps so, but we're also an antivirus. The only way we're going to stop all this destruction is through empathy, love, and kindness, because that will guide us into finding ways to fighting. You know, one person out of kindness and out of love and out of sincerity can bring down a multi-million dollar oil companies need to exploit their areas. It has been done. It can be done. So, you know, remember that everybody out there, we're all part of this. We're all part of this. Even having this conversation right now is enabling all of us to learn from each other. And this is what we need. We need to be unified. We need to be combined again. We need everyone with their opinions explaining to us what their knowledge is. And we don't discard that knowledge. We take it in as part of our own knowledge. And we grow. All of us grow. And the more we can grow, the more we can understand, the more we can look at these problems from multifaceted problems that need multifaceted solutions. There's no um, silver bullet, as they say. So like Sherry says, we can fight back. We can give nature back their rights, and they are doing it. And nature, uh, Sherry's group is doing it, and a lot of other people are doing it by being out on the front line, preserving these animals and their habitats. So today has been very exciting. It was a great day to honor the work of Diane Fossey, one of my personal heroes, um, and to talk about her work and then to talk about the, con the, the context of what we can do next to stop losing our gorillas, I mean, our closest living animal relative, 98% shared DNA, and they are almost been killed into extinction just for a couple dollars. So, you know, that was the old way of thinking. That was the old way of th That's back when they had circuses and they thought exploitation was cool, you know, and I, I, that kind of thinking rolled all the way into the 80s until you know, everything started to to reawaken. So we're all part of this beautiful reawakening. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of people that will never get any recognition. They gave their lives, they gave their time, they gave every penny of what they had. And remember, we all play our part. We're all part of the same army fighting for a better future. So thank you everybody for being on the conversation today. I'm excited. I actually want to go back and reread all these comments. I, I didn't have time to to fully groove into all the comments that we had today. But thank you, everybody, for your knowledge. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for your work. And thank you for being part of our conversation. Because as we always say, it's our world. Let's talk about it.